good morning and if we could have any one person pray for us please uh, and just commit this entire time into the lord's hands let's pray lord we thank you for this time oh lord father we thank you for the uh, another opportunity oh lord father to gather together oh lord father and to learn from your word and lord as we gonna go forward oh lord father into our session Lord, we submit everything into your hands, O oh Lord, Father. Lord, our Holy Spirit, God, we ask you to come and take control over everything, O oh Lord, Father, God, and whatever we are learning today. Lord, we uh, ask that it will fall on the good ground, O oh Lord, Father, bearing 30, 60, and 100 folds for your kingdom in over in our lives, O oh Lord, Father. We thank you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah. So... Today we will look at John chapter 20. We may be able to do a little bit of John 21 as well. Uh, but the next class we will finish with the Gospel of John and we will get into the Epistles of John. Uh, so um, today we will cover as much as possible. Uh, but we will focus a little more uh, upon this chapter here uh, because it talks about the resurrection and the events surrounding that. Um, this is central to our faith our entire faith you know rests on this um, like paul said um, if the hope that we have is only for this life you know the hope that we have in christ is only for this life then uh, we are to be pitied more than all so um, it's this resurrection of jesus which changed everything for us for for for, for us his followers if the resurrection had not happened nothing would have changed you know um, um, jesus atoning sacrifice would not be acceptable to the father uh, we would not be walking in victory because that victory was won on our behalf by jesus uh, so everything uh, depended upon this resurrection which is proof it is solid proof that what jesus did for us was acceptable to the father that we have been forgiven through jesus that now we are empowered by him that uh, because of the victory which he has won, it can now be given to us, you know, and we can walk in that victory which is given to us. All of this um, is centered in this resurrection uh, experience. And so down the ages, we see uh, Satan very actively trying to discredit the resurrection event. Uh, you know, he, so many people, uh, critics came forward and tried to disprove uh, the resurrection. Uh, so much criticism has been done regarding this. So we will take a little more effort to focus on, you know, uh, the events in this chapter and uh, try to answer, uh, you know, the the questions which are generally raised by critics regarding this uh, whole resurrection event. So um, let's get started. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us, uh, John chapter twenty. Uh, maybe if you could read all the way up to verse 10. So John 20, verses 1 to 10, please. John chapter 20, reading from verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and other disciples the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go. He didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrapping lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, uh, they still didn't hadn't understood the scripture that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went. Then they went home. Yeah. So here we have the opening events on the Resurrection Sunday um, in the Jewish culture in their calendar. 
the day begins once the sun goes down. So uh, at the end of the day, when it becomes evening and the sun has gone down, that is when the new day begins for them. So basically their Sunday would begin on the evening of our Saturday. Okay, so, um, so when it says over here early on the first day of the week, they are talking about how the day had already started the previous evening. Okay, so the first day of the week started on the evening of the previous day, immediately after their Sabbath. And then um, now in the early morning, Mary Magdalene and a whole bunch of other ladies have come over here to the tomb uh, to perform some more, uh, you know, uh, burial rituals. So um, on that day, uh, when um, Jesus was crucified and he gave up his spirit, at that time, the, you know, high Sabbath was still going on because it is not just an ordinary Sabbath that day. Even the Passover festival had fallen on that day. So it was a high Sabbath. And uh, so uh, most of the people would have been busy with their Passover, uh, you know, uh, ceremonies. So they would not have wanted to contaminate themselves by associating with a dead body. And so it is only um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who basically come and perform the required ceremonies. Also, the people would have been scared to come and, you know, uh, claim Jesus' body because of all the things which had happened that day. Uh, a lot of evil and injustice took place that day. So all those who are close to Jesus would have been scared to go and show their faces to the authorities. So on that day, it, I mean, very hastily, only two persons take care of the burial uh, ceremonies. So now today, you know, after the festival is all done, Today, Mary and a whole bunch of other women are coming over here. When we look at the four gospel accounts, um, we get to know that at least five women came, but maybe it was more than that. So we don't know exactly how many women together came over here. And um, so even as they come, they are uh, you know uh, wondering how the how they are going to uh, you know remove the stone. We don't see that over here in. Gospel of John, we see that in the other gospel accounts, uh, because in those days, uh, the tomb would have been sealed with a heavy stone. So right there in front of the cave, you know, it's basically the caves which functioned as tombs. So right there in front of the cave, what they would do is they would dig a deep channel, you know, they would make a groove and a large stone would be placed inside that channel, inside that groove. So that you know, when they when they try to roll it, it will be easy to roll it uh, in that ready-made groove grooving which they have made. So that's basically how the um, a door was created for the cave. So here in this case as well, you know, Joseph of Arimathea, being a rich man, has made a tomb, uh, has uh, made a nice tomb for himself, and uh, uh, this is large stone which has been placed, uh, which can be rolled. To cover the tomb and to open the tomb, and they are, uh, you know, in the other gospels, we see the women wondering who's going to help them in in moving this really hefty, large stone. And here in Gospel of John, we are told that when they come, they see that the stone has already been removed from the entrance. Um, and so, in verse two, uh, Mary Magdalene she goes running back to the town. You know, she goes running back to the Simon Peter and uh, to the other disciples. And she tells them they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. So in her mind, there is no thought of resurrection. She's not even thinking about resurrection. Even though Jesus had told them that he would rise from the dead, it had somehow never really sunk in. So neither she nor the others are even thinking in terms of a resurrection. They are thinking in terms of a grave robbery, where someone has had the, uh, you know, uh, the, the the rudeness to actually steal a dead body, and they are very hurt and offended about it. So she comes and says they have taken the Lord away, and we don't know where they have put him. You know, so she's very very concerned, and so when. Uh, Peter and John hear about this, they immediately come running to find out uh, what's going on. Okay, so then we see in verse 5, um, 
the the other disciple outran peter so it's basically john john bends and looks inside but he doesn't come inside but it's peter who actually steps inside it says in verse 6 then simon peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb and then it says he saw the strips of linen lying there and you have a total of six verses devoted to this whole uh, picture of a bunch of linen cloths lying over there why is so much significance attached to these strips of you know linen cloth lying over there why are so many verses being devoted to clearly describing what peter saw with his eyes you know so why so much significance um what are these linen strips that are being talked about we already you know had a reference to that in the previous chapter when nicodemus and jo joseph they are wrapping up jesus body uh, so uh, if we could actually have someone read out that for us john chapter 19 verses 39 and 40 john 19 39 and 40 if someone could read out please oh. John chapter 19, 39 and 40. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of uh, myra and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the pieces, as the custom of the Jews is to worry, bury. So here we are told that when Nicodemus uh, comes, he brings along with him a mixture of myrrh and aloes. These are spices which were used to delay the decomposition of the body. Okay, so it's, a, it's a, something that they're doing to honor uh, the person who has passed away. So they, they make this mixture, they prepare this mixture of myrrh and aloes. It's some kind of combination of spices which is supposed to preserve the body for a little longer and so they take these strips of linen and they start wrapping up the body and as they are wrapping up the body they they pour in this mixture it's like it's like kind of semi-liquid mixture they pour it in they wrap and then they pour it pour some more and then they wrap another uh, portion so in that way right from starting with the feet they start wrapping the entire body and as they go along they keep pouring this mixture so it, and it's very fragrant it smells very good and uh, so they 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 do this wrapping till they reach up to the neck so up to the neck the entire body is wrapped and then as time goes by this you know this semi liquid mixture is going to dry up it's going to get hard so once it becomes it gets hardened the linen will continue sticking to the body okay so that's basically how it will be and then when it comes to the face they did not cover the face that was not their custom what they would do is they would use a head cloth um, you know in uh, verse 7 is where it talks about that yeah it says as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around jesus head and that the word that is used over there that that cloth is called sudarion s o u d a r i o n that's just basically a head cloth now that cloth was not used to cover the face that was a cloth which was kind of you know twisted and folded so it can be tied around the head basically to keep the mouth closed and um, i mean nowadays you have funerals are very posh events but you know when we were children i remember that very clearly you know when when people elderly people would pass away you would have a, a bandage or something which is used to tie around the head to keep the mouth you know to keep the jaw closed so that the fluids don't come out and all of that so that is basically what is being talked about over here so peter goes inside and he sees them lying over there he sees these linen strips lying over there what is the significance of what is being said it basically what these verses are telling is that exactly the way joseph and nicodemus left the cloth pieces when they when they went out and when they sealed the tomb you know and then when after the romans put their seal on the thing whatever position the linen cloth was in that's exactly how it is lying even now by now it would have hardened which means it's you know it's like literally like a cocoon around the body it's it would have become hard and it's all wrapped up 
you know, in a kind of you know, circular uh, shape. And uh, the body was supposed to be inside that. But now you only have the cloth linen lying over there exactly in the same shape because now you know it's they're kind of hardened uh, by the mixture. But there's no body inside. So if someone has robbed this body that has to be one highly skilled robber, how did he manage to get the body out without cutting open the linen? Because you see, it's like a cocoon now. He would literally have to cut, oh, cut it open to remove the body. How do you remove the body out without cutting the linen? But when Peter goes inside, this is what he's seeing. It says over there, he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth. And in fact, it describes how the cloth is. It says it had been that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. No one has touched any of the linen. And I could never quite understand this because, you know, we grew up as children on the NKJV. And the wording over there does not bring out the fact of what Peter actually saw. Um, you know, as a kid, I had this comic book which was given to me about uh, Jesus, uh, you know, um, death, burial, and resurrection. And in the comic book, you basically have the head cloth. You know, someone has neatly folded it, you know, the way we fold the hand napkin or a handkerchief. You, know, you neatly fold it and place it. That, 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 that was the picture which was drawn in my comic book. And so as a kid, you know, I remember thinking, okay, Jesus must have gotten up and even he would have neatly folded the head cloth. Why didn't he fold the rest? You know, maybe he just lost patience. I mean, what, I mean he, he didn't fold the rest of it. It didn't make sense to me because the NKJV is using the wrong wording. You know, that's, that's basically what your NKJV says. Um, where do we have that? I have written it down somewhere. Ah, it, it says, um, uh, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. That wording over there, it's not talking about someone folding together. It's that word, uh, the Greek word over there, it's talking about something which has been twisted and folded in a particular way to form a kind of, you know, a roll. And the roll would have been wrapped around the head to keep the mouth closed so that fluids don't come out. So that, so uh, that cloth is lying in exactly that same rolled up condition, in that folded condition. No one has touched it. So which means when Jesus resurrected, he literally came out of the cloth. You know, the same way he walked in through the, uh, through the wall later on in the same uh, um, chapter. So the resurrected body can go through solid objects without being uh, you know, stopped by them. So everything is in exactly the same position. Only thing, there's no body inside. So that is something which... Peter and John literally saw with their own eyes. And even the women who came over there saw this with their own eyes. And so these are excellent eyewitnesses who are able to confidently say everything, the linen is exactly the same place and shape it's supposed to be in. But there's no body inside it. You know, so they were able to tell about this extraordinary thing which they have witnessed, which they have seen. Um, so. Um, Coming to this whole you know, uh, account of the angels, in the different Gospels, you have different uh, accounts. In some places, it says there's one angel. In one, some places, it says two angels. And so critics say, look at them. You know, they can't even get their story straight. So how can we trust this? You know, these Gospel accounts is what they say. Um, in Matthew, it says that an angel said to the women. And then when you go to Mark uh, chapter 16 over there, um, it talks about a young man sitting wearing a white robe. And then when you look in Luke 24, there it talks about um, um, two men in dazzling, shining um, uh, clothing. And then in John, it talks about um, the, the two angels whom Ma Mary Magdalene sees. So why is there a difference in the accounts? So let's start piecing together this story to really understand the sequence of events which took place. Because none of these events are wrong. None of them has re recorded anything which is false. They all are true eyewitness accounts about the resurrection. 
So this is basically how it probably would have happened. You know, if you were to bring all these accounts together and carefully read it line by line, this is basically how I would say, you know, the, the sequence of events can be uh, understood. So you have the women coming over there and then they look into the tomb and they see that the body is no longer there. And Mary Magdalene is very upset and she immediately runs back and informs the disciples about it. And uh, so after she informs them, then you have John and Peter running to confirm, find out whether what she's saying is true or not. So then they come. And she doesn't come running al back along with them. You know, the woman has already gone all the way to the town. She must be tired. Uh, she would not have the energy to run all the way back with them. So she obviously would be coming a little later. She does come back, but she's not yet come back. In the meantime, what about the other women? Did they all go running along with Mary Magdalene to tell the disciples? No, they probably would have still been standing over there. You know, They probably are searching in that entire garden to see whether the body has been hidden somewhere or put somewhere else. So here you have women moving around you know, in, in ones or twos, and they all have encounters with these angels. One of them have an encounter with one angel. One of them have an encounter with two angels. Maybe one of them sees, in, sees uh, the angel in a, you know, in, a, in, a, in a dazzling manner. To the other person, maybe the angel you know, looked like an ordinary person. They're all giving their what they saw with their eyes. And without making any changes, those words have been recorded as it is. So depending on the eyewitness reports that Matthew is recording, that Mark is recording, they write down whatever they have received from you know, their set of eyewitnesses. So no, nothing has been changed. No facts have been changed. It's just that you have a lot of women moving around at that time, you know, um, looking for the body. And they all encounter the angels separately in their own way. And when all of this is happening, Mary Magdalene is not here on the scene. And now after these women have their encounter with the angels and the angels tell them he's, he's, he's no longer dead, he is risen. They are so excited. They run now. They run back to go and tell the disciples about what they have seen. And in the meantime, Mary Magdalene has come back over here. And there's nobody else with her. Only she is there. And she is still looking. So you see, at this point of time, she is still looking. And she has not yet seen any angels. That has not yet happened to her. And and you know, having understood this sequence of events, now we come to verse 11. Okay, so if we could have someone read out for us verses 11 to 14, please. 11 to 14. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, and as she wept, she stood down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have led him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed, supposing him to be the, gen, the gardener said to him, Sir, if you have laid him, and I will take him away, Jesus said to her, okay, Mary. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's just you know focus on uh, what has been said so far. Uh, so here, uh, you know, she's standing over there, weeping, wondering what to do. Uh, it, it looks like the other women have already had their encounter with the angels, and they have already gone. So she doesn't get to talk to them. They don't talk to her. She's standing over there. She's weeping. She looks inside, and now she sees the two angels, and they talk to her, and they say to her. You know, woman, why are you crying? And she says, they have taken my Lord away. I mean, you know, Jesus is no longer here on the scene. As far as they know, he's gone, he's dead. But still, look at that love and loyalty of this, you know, this Joseph of Arimathea, of Nicodemus, of Mary, of these other women. They still regard him as their Lord, even though they think that he is dead and gone. So it shows the love that they had towards him, the deep loyalty which they had you know, towards him. And uh, so she says, they have taken my Lord away, is what she says. And she does not realize that it is Jesus. So she does not recognize Jesus. And this, uh, there seems to be a lot of problem uh, 
uh, recognizing Jesus after the resurrection. You know, you have two, three examples where they do not recognize him, which makes me assume that probably, you know, when we all receive our resurrected bodies, we'll probably look different from the way we look now. So in case you're very sentimentally attached to your face, you know, your current face, you probably may not have that same face in your resurrected body. So I'm just assuming that I think resurrected bodies look different. Uh, our faces will look different at that time, you know, so because they could not recognize Jesus. Uh, so anyway, Jesus identifies himself and then you have the conversation continuing. So yes, now if you could read out for us uh, verses 16 to 18. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciple that she what she had seen the lord that she had seen the lord and that he had spoken these things to her yeah so the very first witnesses who testified about the you know uh, resurrection of jesus was a bunch of women women were not considered very important in those days in fact they were not considered very clever so a woman's testimony did not have much value in those days, you know, and uh, if you have a court case going on, nobody would bother to call a woman to testify because women were not taken seriously. Yet God chooses women to be the very first witnesses to testify about this most important event of all mankind. You know, God could have chosen some very important personalities to be the first persons who will witness and give testimony. But Jesus chose women instead, you know, because in his eyes, women are important and women do have the ability to carry valuable, important messages, you know, the same way men have uh, the capability of doing it. So in God's eyes, you know, the status of women is different and God chooses to use women uh, to be the very first witnesses and so the critics who came later you know and, and uh, la later on in the 19th century and they they, they said uh, oh these people made up these stories about jesus you know if they were making up stories they definitely would have written uh, stories of male witnesses they would not have written the story of female witnesses because female witnesses had no value or worth in those days so if these are not cooked up stories these are actual events which took place and the, the first witnesses were really women and so therefore the writers of the gospel recorded the, them as being women okay so not no facts were changed no stories were cooked up at any point of time and um, so uh, it's the witness of women which is first you know um, used by god to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. Now, coming to this whole incident of, uh, you know, um, Mary clinging on to him and then Jesus saying to him, do not hold on to me. Um, uh, again, oh, the translation of verse 17 was rather bad in the KJV, which led to a lot of uh, wrong ideas because in the KJV originally, it was written as don't touch me. No, uh, um, uh, KJV, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. And uh, so uh, it kind of made people think that, okay, now that Jesus has a resurrected body, he's like very holy and nobody should touch him and contaminate him, you know, with their human hands and all of that. There's a lot of wrong, um, um, wrong ideas that came up out of this. So NKJV tried to change that, you know, they wanted to bring out the translation more accurately. So then in your NKJV, it says, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. And here in the NIV, which I, you know, which I generally use, uh, it, it's translated as do not hold on to me. And uh, so basically Jesus is saying to her, you know, you're, you're holding on to me, clinging to me, like as if you, you know, I mean, you know, you're never going to let go of me ever again. But you know what? I'm actually going to ascend to the father. So I'm only going to be here for a little while. 
and just as he has warned you know in, in, within 14 days he in fact uh, ascends to the father and goes away so over here the m the the basic meaning which jesus is conveying to her is i'm not here on a permanent basis don't go on clinging on to me i'm going to be ascending to the father so go and give this good news to the disciples that i am going to be ascending to the father and it's not just to my father that i'm going to be ascending i'm going to be ascending to my father and your father because now the disciples are not just disciples they are brothers status has changed a major status change has taken place now up to now the disciples were you know followers and disciples but now these disciples have become brothers they have become family members a high status change has taken place so this is the really good news which jesus wants her to go running and give to the disciples that he you know just as he had promised earlier that you know he's going to go to the father um so he's he's saying go tell them you know uh, i'm ascending to my father and your father so instead of clinging on to me because i'm not going to be here forever i'm actually going to go i'm going to ascend and then what i promised you it will happen so what had jesus promised them earlier you know he had told them that once he goes he will send the holy spirit to them and also he had talked about some great things which are going to happen when he goes to the father and that is basically what he is emphasizing over here now so maybe we should actually look at those verses in john chapter 16 uh, verse 26 to 28 it's important that we look at that john 16 26 to 28 if someone could read out please in that day that day you will ask in my name and i do not say to you that i shall pray the father for you for the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that i came forth from father i came forth from the father and have come into the world again i leave the world and go to the father exactly so something jesus, jesus said something very significant in john 16 he said now onwards i won't be asking the father for things on your behalf you can directly go to him and in my name you can ask him and he will give you so a great status change is going to take place up to now you know i was the son so you know i as the son would go to the father and then make requests on you on, on your behalf and then the father would say yes or no because you 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 know you had not yet been cleansed of your sins you had not yet become family members so i had to like stand as a mediator in between and then you know i would take your requests i would place them before him and then he, then he would listen now they he, now the heavenly father is no longer just jesus father he's also the father of the disciples they have all now become jesus brothers so now they have the same status as jesus so now jesus doesn't have to go and you know beg in front of god the father saying please do this for them no the, the same way jesus used to confidently go to the father with that same level of confidence all the brothers and sisters of jesus can now also can, can we also can now confidently go to him and claim with the same level of confidence which jesus has and the father will say yes to us with the same love with which he used to say yes to the son so that is the great status change which has taken place and so now um, um, you know jesus is basically saying to mary don't cling on to me because there's something greater to come i need to go away i need to ascend to the father because when i do that then all my brothers and sisters will be able to have this direct access to the father okay so that's basically what he is conveying over here in these uh, verses so um in light of what we have talked about just now i think it is very important for us to understand that Jesus is not sitting over there in heaven praying for us. Okay, there's this kind of um, wrong idea that people have that Jesus is sitting there in heaven praying for us. It's like a Protestant equivalent of the Catholic idea. The Catholics believe that a prayer will really be heard only if Mary is praying. So they pray to Mary and they ask Mary for things and their hope is that Mary will, will then go to, the, to God um, or rather to Jesus 
and then you know make place the requests now that's not what jesus is doing you know it's not like we pray to jesus and then jesus goes to Je uh, to god the father and says you know please these people are asking for this 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 you know can you do that for them jesus is not um exercising that kind of a prayer role there are two verses in the new testament which are talking about jesus interceding for us but it's not this kind of a prayer which is being talked about let's look at those two verses because we need to get this concept right okay so romans 8 34 if someone could read out uh yeah that that's the first verse we will look at romans 8 34. romans 8 and verse 34 who is the who is he who condemns it is christ who died and furthermore furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of god who also makes intercession for us it talks about how no one can condemn us now because jesus christ has died for us and he is at the right hand of god interceding for us okay talks about intercession over there let's also look at the other reference which talks about jesus as an intercessor hebrews 7 5 if someone could read out hebrews 7 5 hebrews 7 5 and indeed those who are of the sons of levi who receive the prostitute prostitute have a commandment to receive titles titles from the people according to the law that yeah, is yeah. from are, you, are we looking at the same or did i get my reference wrong hebrews 7 5. Hmm. Yeah. maybe i wrote the reference wrong hebrews 7 5 therefore he is able to save completely those who come to god through him because he always lives to intercede for them that's not the reference is it have i written it down wrong I... 725 I think is the one which says yeah, he's able to save completely yes. so, okay okay fine that, that's totally my mistake I will, I'll correct it later in my notes thanks thank you okay so uh, yeah Hebrews 725 so again in Hebrews 7, 725 also it talks about Jesus interceding okay so we need to look at these two verses in the light of what Jesus said Jesus very plainly said in John 16, verse 26, I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. So the days of Jesus having to you know, intercede for us in that sense, those days are now over. Now we have been raised to a status where we are on an equal footing with Jesus as far as our sonship is concerned. In the same way that he is the son, we too are sons and daughters. Our status has now been raised to that level. So now he doesn't have to go and beg on our behalf. We can go confidently to his throne and claim uh, you know, whatever we require for our life. So now Jesus is no longer in that capacity. He doesn't go to the Father and say, Lord, please give this person a job. Lord, please give her finances. Lord, please solve this problem that this person is having. No we are supposed to go and do that we are supposed to go to the father in jesus name and place our requests before him and take from him whatever we require for our lives that status has now been granted to us so over here that word which the hebrew word which is being used you know it it's, that's the word for mediation uh that's the hebrew word which is used in romans 8 34 and hebrews 7 25 the correct reference okay. so so in these two verses that word intercession it's that word he, he greek word for mediator so jesus is standing is seated over there at the right hand of the father as a permanent reminder of what he has done for us so the atoning sacrifice which he has done has now completely changed our status now we have been accepted by God, forgiven by God, declared as righteous. So he is sitting over there as a permanent reminder of what has been achieved. So in that sense, he is our intercessor. He's our permanent intercessor in that sense. But he's not like the Catholic concept of Mary going and begging and saying, Lord, please do this for this person. Please do that. No, 
nobody needs to beg for us we have been given this high status of being considered brothers and sisters of jesus himself and so we are literally are the ad adopted children of god himself we can on our own go to the father and jesus said over there in john 16 he said no the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that i came from god so that is why he says go to the father yourselves in my name and we looked at the you know the meaning of in my name you know we looked at how when we ask for anything in line with jesus name in line with what he would approve of in line with his priorities and his standards so when we are praying in jesus name we can directly go to the father and ask make our own requests okay so uh, we need we need to understand this that here you know jesus is not acting like some kind of a mary and doing some kind of intercessory uh, thing on our behalf okay so that's just to clarify that particular point um so let's move on from there now um so um, jesus now appears to the disciples so in G in john chapter 20 if we could have someone read out for us 19 to 23 john 20 19 to 23 verse 19 then the same day at evening, being the first day, being being the first day of the week, when the dock when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, "Peace be with you." When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they when they saw the lord so the so jesus said to them again peace to you as the father has sent me i also send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them. they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained all right so um they are uh, the disciples are now in uh, locked up in a room and you can imagine what the main topic of discussion is because you know just in the morning they got the shock of their lives yeah, they had all these women coming to them one after another saying oh, we've seen angels and the angels are saying that jesus is resurrected so they're busy discussing this i'm sure in that closed room uh, and they're all closed up over there because they're scared of the jews it says over here and so then Jesus literally comes through the wall. The doors are closed. Jesus does not open the door and come. He literally comes through the wall and he says to them, peace be with you. So they've been very agitated. They've been very scared. They've been very confused. And now he speaks peace upon them. Now over here in the John's gospel, it doesn't talk about what else he says. In the other uh, gospels, you get to know that he also gives them a nice scolding. Um, we see that especially in Mark chapter 16. I think we should look at that. Um, because he's he's quite upset with them for their lack of faith. Um, you Mark 16, 9 to 14. If someone could read out Mark 16, 9 to 14. Yeah. Mark 16, 9 to 14. Mark 16, reading from verse 9. After Jesus rose from the dead, early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them that, told them what had happened. But when she told them the, that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they did not believe her. Afterward, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. 
So here we get to know that Jesus speaks peace upon them, but he also scolds them and he says, you know, I've, you know, he basically is saying to them, I've sent so many witnesses, eyewitnesses to you one after another. They all came and told the same thing that I have been resurrected, but you refuse to believe even one of them. The first person who came was Mary Magdalene. Uh, and then it says over there, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. It says in verse 11. So he scolds them for their stubborn refusal to believe. Okay, so um, the rest of the events, we will look at them after we get back from our break. Thank you.